Food. Wild food. That's what hunting and gathering is all about. This is a journey into Britain's ancient way of life as we attempt to find the foods eaten by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. I've been lucky enough to travel all over the world studying how indigenous people manage to make their livings with just what nature will provide them. But one thing that has always frustrated me is how little we know about our own ancestors, the people who hunted and gathered here in Britain. My partner on this journey is Professor Gordon Hillman of University College London. He spent his life studying how people have used plants throughout history. Our landscape is rich in history, waiting for archaeologists to uncover. Within it are clues of what our past might have been. But archaeology isn't the only way to find out. So in this programme, I want to do something different. I want to take you somewhere the hunter-gatherer lifestyle still survives in all its vibrant, exciting glory. We've come literally to the other side of the planet in our quest to understand more about British wild foods. This is the Tanami Desert in the center of Australia. We've come here to see the cultural relationship that the Aboriginals here have with their wild foods, or as they call them, bush tucker. We're on our way to meet up with some people from the Walpuri tribe. But before we start, I think an initiation is in order. Gordon can't travel with me and expect to get off scot-free. Well, Gordon, you know, we can't come to Australia without looking for one particular bush tucker. Oh, dear. I have a horrible feeling about what's coming. <laughs> That's exactly right. We're looking for witchetty grubs. And these... Uh, I thought that was going to be a... These are witchetty bushes. Oh, right. Gordon's worked all over the world, but he's never seen hunter-gatherers in action. This is the most iconic Aboriginal food. It's also particularly wriggly. So, obviously parallel to Britain, in that we've got plenty of insects there that are quite big and juicy. Exactly. I mean, I think part of coming here is to open our minds to the possibilities of what our ancestors may have been using. Indeed. I don't know if you can see this, Gordon, but you can see there where some of these bits of soil where things have emerged oh, from yes, underground. Oh yes, where the adult forms have uh, come out from pupation. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. It must be close. Um, uh, oh, there oh, it is. Oh, wow. Gordon, you can tease that out with a little stick, look. Oh, I see, that's right. They go into the roots and the roots swell oh, right. around them. Right. They're delicious, they're really, really not, I like them. Mm -hmm. Can you get hold of it? Yep. You should get hold of it. Okay. I'm not going to eat the head end. No, you hold the head. I hold and the you head. Bite the rest off from oh. the head. Give it a two. Look at that. You hold the head. Hold okay. the head like between your fingers like that. Okay. That's it. <laughs> it's okay. They're nice. A bit of leaf. They're nice. I like them. Egg yolk flavour. Yeah. Good. There's a touch of, a touch of fruitiness to it. Everybody's really squeamish about them, but they're delicious yes, and they're, they're, they're very, very satisfying. Delicious. I don't know if I'd want to live on it, but it's, it is, I can, you can sense it's nutritious, certainly, your body tells you. There you go, you see how they are, that one's all curled up in there, it doesn't want to come out. Just break them and pull them out. You got to turn narrow. They're beautiful, yeah. Like that. Interesting. Oh, that's good. Mm. 
Ich habe ein paar Namen. These days, the Walpuri spend much of their time in town, in Alice Springs. But they regularly return to the country, and there's plenty of room in our car. What name have you given Gordon? Jungalai. Jungalai. He's a tango dreaming rock wallaby dream. <laughs> He's always hopping around. <laughs> and Gordon's got three wives. <laughs> This is Walpuri land, where they traditionally hunted kangaroo and wallaby and gathered wild plants. Just one generation ago, they used to roam this country, living off only what they found and creating temporary camps along the way. We're going to be staying here a couple of days before moving on to another part of Australia. One of the Aboriginal women said to me a few minutes ago, she came over and goes, really good to be here on the land. And that's something they feel really deep inside. And I'm feeling that too. It's a long while since I've been to Australia, out in the desert, but it's exciting to be here. Can you just hold that there for me, Gordon? Okay. Just come out here. I'll just tie it around this termite mound, Gordon. This is a great way to camp. A bit of shade and a bedroll is all that I need. That's good. We won't undo this yet. Don't want anything to crawl in them. <laughs> Whatever. For Noreen and the other ladies, home is even simpler. A patch of clear ground and a fire. Ready for a brew, Gordon? Well, that sounds great, Greg. Good job. What do you think? I'll bring it over. Well, and what's your impression so far? I'm just amazed at the richness of the desert here. There's so many, not only is there quite a lot of, uh, of, of, of plant colour, it's just so, there's so much of it that's usable. Yeah, and what's exciting for me is knowing your, your botanical knowledge and your archaeological knowledge is for you to see how these sorts of people think about their landscape and how they actually work with the plants and the food resources themselves. Very exciting prospect. Very exciting indeed. Gordon and I are mainly interested in plant use in Aboriginal Britain. Whilst animals at least leave bones to give archaeologists something to study, very little work has been done on the subject of plants, as the remains have mostly rotted away. We've got problems. Yeah. Number nine, yeah. That looks promising. In Australian yeah. Aboriginal culture, it's the women who gather the plants while the men go hunting. So it's the women who hold the knowledge Gordon and I are after. I have good beans later on. What they found is what they call wanakichi, wanakichi, which is the bush tomato. It's in the um, nightshade family, a solanum. And you can see there from the flowers, reminiscent of uh, woody nightshade back in the UK. Audrey singing like this is typical of these people. Each food has its own song. It's a sign of the value accorded to each resource. 
Take the song for Wana Gigi. We clean the sea there. Clean him out. 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 Clean Thank you. That's great. Lovely. It's a bit cucumbery. It's nice. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Very refreshing. Very refreshing. Thank you. So what are we looking for here? Obviously, the plants will be different from Britain, though the techniques will be similar. But it's the mindset that will be most important when we're thinking about our own plants. This is the bush potato. It's everywhere. But as Pamela and the others test the ground, I'm wondering which are the right ones to select. Efficiency is everything to a hunter-gatherer society. Other things I could tell you that the bush potato is ready. When there's a little crack in the ground, then uh, sweet potatoes there. Ah, right. You see these ones here, roots going down. That means there's a sweet potato in there. Yes. This is a sign of the times. Metal digging sticks have replaced wooden ones, but the women aren't using shovels. They know that their traditional techniques are still the best. A long way down. Can you imagine trying to dig that with a shovel or with a it wouldn't work, would it? I'm watching carefully. She's digging around the root. Absolutely not tugging on it or right. putting any pressure on it at all. Yeah. See, and the, the soil's still on it, so you can see how carefully she's cut around it. Noreen, we've had a pretty good morning, haven't we? We've got um, sweet potato, yellow, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yellow. Yeah. Wanakichi, which is the bush, bush tomato. And uh, yakateria, look, yakateria, yellow nice one yellow there. One. Yeah, the bush raisin, desert like raisin. That. Now, how did, in the old days, people know which was the most important of the foods to collect? That's the way I learned from old people. I used to hunt around with old people. They used to take us out camping when I was around about eight years old. I used to sit on with old people. So the old people knew? Yeah. This in here. I'm so glad we came here. Working and living with such vibrant people is the perfect way to get the right mindset for our journey into our own hunter-gatherer past. This is cooking how I like it, at its direct, simple, best. Try one of these. What do I do? Yeah. And take the skin off, yeah? Tell you what, we ought to get Gordon over, shall we? Where's Gordon? Gordon! Come and try some of this. This is good. Yeah, there's some here. Take the skin off and just like we take the skin off from the potato. Oh, that's lovely. Just you won't like that, Gordon. You can eat with that skin too. That's just delicious. It's absolutely delicious. Sweet and and then starchy and nice. really a bit It's of, better uh, than potato. It's a filling food, isn't it? <laughs> Tell you what, I don't think I'm going back to town. I think I'm going to stay here. Please do a jump when you be Times like this, it's nice to sit and contemplate. And I was thinking, all the times I've been here in Australia, 
I spent most of my time with Aboriginal people, so I really don't know modern Australia at all. That's a strange thought, but despite that, I'd forgotten some simple things. I'd forgotten, for example, how important fire is to Aboriginal people. It doesn't matter where you take them, if you, you go and you stop just for an hour, they'll light a fire because it gives them a sense of place. It's their way of establishing, this is our country. It's a social focus, a place to sit and tell stories and maintain their cultural traditions. It's tremendously important. Hunter-gatherers travel light, making the tools they need along the way. So craft skills are just as important as plant knowledge. And for me, the most typical example of this is the creation of a boomerang. But not just any boomerang. Japaljari has a very special one to show me. Number seven. Boomerang, oh, might have been number seven. So that's the, no, shape. Like this. That's the shape of boomerang you know, mate. Yeah. You call that a number seven boomerang. Number seven boomerang. <laughs> and what was that for? Such fighting. Fighting. Fighting this is soft ground, not really soft ground. Make him a little bit of clear, I can have a look. Ah, yeah. he's right there. Oh, and that's right. what come. It's not something that's used these days, but it's a classic yeah. demonstration of the skill of people like Japaljari. The shape is formed by the trunk and the root. Right. That's it. I'll be right. It's the middle of the morning and not particularly cold, but of course, Japaljari wants a fire. He's not going to use it for the boomerang, it just gives him a sense of place. Got a fire here? Yeah. Right here? No, this way. This way there? Yeah. <laughs> Can I do some of that? Yeah. Can I do some? Yeah. This whole culture is based on knowledge sharing, so Japaljari is more than happy for me to help out. It absolutely typifies the generous nature of Aboriginal life. Sometimes I got chainsaw. Chainsaw? Yeah. That's cheating? Yeah, that's cheating. You can't use a chainsaw. No. <laughs> You can't tell me that while I'm sharpening the axe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, long time ago. Stone axe. Stone axe, yeah. Stone axe, yeah. long time ago. Long time ago. Cool. Did you, when you were a boy, did you know people who'd used the stone axe? I, I've seen them with my eye. You've seen them with your own eye? Yeah, and so now, like this. Yeah. Like this, you know? Huh. Put the string on that way. Yeah. And away, call them on that one. Stone axe. Stone axe. Stone axe. Hard work. Yeah. While I'm busy with Japaljari, it's a chance for Gordon to reflect on his impressions of this area so far. Compared to the deserts I've known before, like the Karakum Desert in Central Asia and Sahara in North Africa, this is a very different type of desert. Extraordinarily rich, not only in cover generally, um, it's much more uh, vegetated, but also the diversity of edible things. Uh, uh, of course, this is partly because we've got the tradition still surviving here, and we know more about it through, 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 the, the, through these experts, the Aboriginal peoples, who still use these plants, like, like, like uh, Jebel Jara. If we had people like him still surviving in, in, in our area, in Europe, um, that would be fantastic. We've lost that knowledge. It's gone thousands of years ago. And so to be somewhere where the, this knowledge still uh, persists, where the people who use these plants or whose parents or grandparents use these plants in, uh, as their main means of survival is an incredible privilege. A coat of oil brings out the finish of the boomerang beautifully, but this one is not really for throwing. The most important thing is you have to tell me how this was used and why it's this shape. This goes around the shield, is that right? Here got a shield, 
How do you feel? Yeah. And you got to, you got to go close up. And he hit him with that one. Hit him with that one. So go around the shield. Catch him in the arm. Yeah. Just grab him there. Really. See, he's done. Done. Too Beautiful. Good. Pleasure. Nice to do it with you. Jabal Jari. Jabal Jari. Yeah. <laughs> Bit by bit, we're piecing together an attitude, a way of looking at the world. But there's a fragility to this way of life. The knowledge needs to be protected. A few hours down the road lives Peter Latz. He's catalogued this plant knowledge in what many consider to be the best guide to Aboriginal plant use, the book Bushfires and Bush Tucker. So what was it initially that uh drew you to study bush foods and, and the Aboriginal use of the plants? Well, I, I, I saw what was happening in other parts of Australia where this knowledge was getting lost. And, um, you know, I love my desert people and I wanted to make sure that their knowledge wasn't go, uh, didn't go the same way. So um, I hurriedly went around and tried to get it all um, down so that it's there forever. Peter, one of the things that um, we're really interested in is bush tucker and the way they interacted with plants here. Um, can you tell me something about that? Uh, plants were the, the fallback thing. Like everyone loved meat uh, and you know kangaroos and so on. But plants were much re reliable. Um, but hell, you had to have a damn good idea of the country and, and what was where, when. Uh, it required a tremendous amount of knowledge of the land. When you wrote your book, uh, were there any great surprises in terms of uh, things you hadn't encountered before with your own experience with the same people? Oh, yeah. If you go out with them and they show you things, and it looks damn easy and straightforward, but you try and do it yourself, yes, and yes. you realise, and I've tried to do that, I've gone out and tried to live out in the bush by myself, and I soon come back begging for knowledge from the old people, and they say, oh, just do this. I mean, the prime example was um, this bean. Um, in a long pod, you know, and, and they said you can eat that when it's at the right stage, just like peas. So I tried to eat it like peas, you know, pull it open, and of course it wouldn't pull open, and it had bitter juice on the outside of the pod. So eventually when I managed to get the seed out, it tasted awful. <laughs> and so I went back to them, I said, oh, you told me you could eat this. And, and they said, oh, I like that Spinifex, throw the beans on it, and, uh, and then it easily comes apart, dries up the bitter juices, and, and, of course and it has lovely smoke flavour. They didn't just survive. I mean, I could probably go out there and survive somehow or another, uh, but they, they could have elaborate ceremonies that went on for months and months. You know, I tell Aborigines, um, you know, what you have to recognise with white people is that they walk around the bush, they're practically blind, they're practically deaf, <laughs> and they can't smell, you know, so you've got to show them every little thing. <laughs> As the sun sets, back in camp, a privilege awaits us. A glimpse of the sort of ceremony Peter was talking about. We're being shown a number of tribal dances relating to bush food. This is the dance of the bush potato, which mirrors the action we saw earlier when they were dug up. This is the dance of the blue-tongued lizard. It's Noreen who describes what's going on to us. We set up from our camp. We went out hunting. Started hunting around for blue little lizards, blue dunks. Put it in a little food carrier. Then we sat down and started cooking blue dunks. Yeah. 
And when you dance that dance, what does that mean? You're doing more than dancing, aren't you? But that was my grandfather's, my mother and uncle's dreaming what we were dancing today. So there's a religious significance yep. to the dance. Dreaming is a Western word. I find it very unsatisfactory. It's used to describe something that is more felt than spoken, a connection each person has to a particular part of nature. It's the way Aboriginals guarantee the continuity of their culture by taking responsibility for a particular resource and passing it on to the next generation. Dances like this have religious significance and cannot be performed on a whim. When tourists come around, we have to get a permission from elders first and they'll say yes. Because we don't want to just go and then do the dancing without our dinner, without no permission. They'll get angry with us, the elders. Yeah, we could have a respect for the elders to do the right way. Not just the elders, you maybe respect your ancestors as well, is that right? Yeah. Amazing dancing, wasn't it? That was absolutely fantastic. What I think is really interesting is how even such mundane, seemingly mundane tasks as digging up a sweet potato and collecting fruit yes. are embodied in significant dances. Yes. I wonder if back in Britain we had the dance of the burdock or the crab apple or the hawthorn berry. Yes, I think these are real possibilities. What I think is interesting though is that this is a culture that has survived, some people say, 60,000 years. Yes. So some of these stories may have been already in circulation at the time when our hunter-gatherers were active and maybe been told already for thousands of years. Yes, absolutely. It's been fabulous to remind myself of the strength of this culture. But of course the desert is very different from any environment in Britain and tomorrow it's time to leave. see plants that are more directly relevant to those we'll find back home. We're heading north to the top end, Arnhem Land. Arnhem Land is one of the largest indigenous areas anywhere in the world. Almost half the size of Britain, you can only enter it by special arrangement. The road into Arnhem Land has improved dramatically since I first came here, but it's still a long and difficult drive for me and Gordon. Ramanginning, our destination, is a whole day's drive, and what a drive. Well, Gordon, I don't think we've got much time to get no, camp sun, up. Sun's sinking. sun's sinking fast. If you crack the firewood, yeah, I'll get the camp set up. It's worth the little effort at the end of it. You know, I always when I get to the end of the day like this, I just don't feel like putting the camp up. But you know, we pushed hard for 20 minutes and we don't have to do it. Yeah, so literally if you take a minute. Yeah. Check 
Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's fantastic scenery we've been to today. Amazing. Yeah. We've barely arrived, and looking out over the Arafura swamp is already having an effect on Gordon. This landscape's very moving. It's the, it's a hugely rich, and there's incredibly few people out there. This represents, in some ways, the end of a 13,000-year-old story, though not the end here, really. The process started with the rise of cultivation in the Near East, maybe in China and other centres, and the inexorable, slow erosion, uh, encroachment of hunter-gatherer lands by farming, farming populations that were ever-expanding, that began 13,000 years ago. And for most of the world, that process has now reached its, its culmination with the real extermination, really, of the old life way. Here, however, we've got an exception, and uh, very moving. <laughs> For us in Britain today, water lilies are little more than a pond ornament, but we believe they were once a staple food. Reminginning has a well-stocked supermarket, but the abundance of wild food here and the remoteness of the region make it easier for traditional skills to coexist with the modern world. Thank you. <laughs> Marley, I need you to show me which bit I should follow with my hands. Any leaf. So I took this leaf here, would that be good? It's important to wade in and join in. If you just look, you often miss important details in the gathering technique. <laughs> Much of the water lily can be eaten, but the most important bits are the large root bulb, or tuber, and also its fruit. <laughs> oh, there you have the fruit with its seeds inside. It's good. It's certainly not, not, not bitter. That's good. Not at all bitter. Slightly like the seeds of cucumber. That's true. It has a cucumbery flavour. Yeah. Mm, that's good. It's not hard to see why this plant might be important. It doesn't take long to gather a good haul, it's easy to cook, and it's available for much of the year. As well as being edible raw, water lily seeds can be processed to improve the taste preserve them, and make them easier to digest. When it comes to cooking utensils, this is all that's needed. A leaf protects the cake from the ashes. So is it now well, that looks very different. It's very tasty. I think that you wouldn't need to, if you, if you ate a, a few, few cakes like that, they'd be quite full up quite quickly. Yes. Because it's a good sustaining food. We've always suspected that water lilies were, were, were perhaps an important food in Britain, not, not just because it's the only seed food that's turned up on archaeological sites, but also because we have the record from North America from very similar water lilies. For their having played a very significant role amongst people such as the Klamath, uh, for whom it provided the principal starch staple for three months or so of the year. But this has been now reinforced, this is this suspicion, by the local people here and their comments on the, on the role of water lily in their diet.
There are three generations tucking into this food. Tradition and modernity seem to sit side by side in their lives. You don't want to bump into one of these bushes in the dark because the edges of the leaves are covered in thorns. This is the pandanus and it's got lots of uses. Later on, in a few weeks' time, we'll find fruits on this that contain an edible seed. And at the base of the fruit, there's a fibrous material you can suck a palm oil from. It's really delicious. And for Aboriginal people, this was a tremendously important tree. Today, the women have come out to, to collect the top fronds, which they're going to use to produce fibres for the manufacture of dilly bags or carrying bags. Gathering bags are extremely important in all hunter-gatherer societies, but there's no trace of the ones our ancestors used. Everything has rotted away. <coughs> Nonetheless, I've used very similar processes to this myself, with plants in Britain like nettles and willow. And our ancestors simply must have had some form of similar basketry. This is the way skills are taught in this way of life. And these children clearly have a thirst for knowledge. Of course, as with everything these women do, we're talking so much more than subsistence living. They use roots and leaves to dye the pandanus. There's beauty and color in everything here. And the same could well have been true of our own ancestors. They call this root yellow. No prizes for guessing why. After boiling for an hour or so, it comes out looking like this. Then it's dried overnight. It's been a fascinating day. Found all sorts of things here. This is a eucalyptus. I haven't been able to key down exactly which one yet, so I've got a bit of work to do. But uh, the local people use this to treat colds and headaches. And when you crush the leaf up, I know you can't smell it at home, but you probably know this smell because this is very strong eucalyptus oil. It's exactly like you get out of the pharmacy at home. Lovely smell. And then there's this. This is the dry, dead trunk from a pandanus. To tell you about this, I need to set light to it first. These were used as slow matches for nomadic groups traveling through the outback, keeping their fire alight. it burns like a giant cigarette and that's because it's basically just one big massive bundle of fibers it's quite uh, astonishing to think that uh, people used to travel with their fire alight all the time carrying it just like this there are stories of people who'd lost their fire the fire had gone out and it's a bit mysterious because most of the groups you work with here have the ability to make fire by rubbing sticks in one way or another. But anyway, within those stories, they tell of having to send people, runners, to other communities, hundreds of kilometres sometimes away, to collect fire and bring it back. And uh, this is the method they would have used. Sunset brings a spectacular sight. Fire stick farming in the nearby forest. It's the Aboriginal way of controlling the undergrowth. It also encourages new shoots, which in turn attract animals to graze, which are then hunted. It's effective and at night truly a strangely beautiful sight.
Next morning brings a chance for us to take a look at some of the trees growing around our camp. This is a cycad, and uh, this tree uh, is, is, is pretty fully full grown. It's, it not only looks primeval, but it is primeval. It goes back to before many of the dinosaurs roamed the earth, and it's, uh, it's ancient in many ways. Here we have ovules, these individual blobs here, uh, ovules, uh, seed producing units, which are actually naked. In, in flowering plants, they've been covered over and protected. Here they're naked, it's so, so primitive and this is redolent of a very distant past indeed. One of the most interesting trees here in the top end is this here. This is a paper bark. It's a fantastic resource. You can see here it's been scorched when the fires burned through here. In fact, it looks to me like this but a country is due for burning again this year. And the bark protects the tree from fire and you can peel it off in sheets. And paper bark really is a good name for it. And it's quite interesting because the, the bark is a protection to the tree from fire, but we can also use it for fire lighting. If I scrape up some fine shavings at the edge of a knife, I can just drop some sparks into that. And away it goes. It's kind of like the local equivalent to our birch bark. So there's an interesting thing. And of course, this bark's got loads of other uses. It was used for cooking, for making shelters, for making rafts across these crocodile infested waters. It's got lots and lots of uses, even, even used to wrap up bones as part of funeral uh, ceremonies. Very interesting. Amazing material. But Gordon's particular expertise is grasses. Do you have any use for this grass here? Do you use it as food at all? Yes. Just this, this end? One. Like uh, sugar cane. Like sugar cane? Yes. yes. Do you boil it up with water or no, do you no, just no, eat, no, it, no. eat it straight? No, straight. Like. You chew it? You can make a sugar out of it? Yeah, it's no water. Can I bring up this? Oh, I see you use that when, when there's no water and it's dry. Yeah. You chew on this. Yeah. To give you some moisture. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Like dalmen. 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 Sweet. Is it sweet, Christopher? The pandanus has dried overnight and it doesn't take long for Robin to knock up a bag. This sort of dexterity comes with constant practice. Spotting a guana like this is a chance for wild meat, a chance no hunter-gatherer will let pass. It's the impetus for Clara, Robin, and the others to cook us an impromptu feast with yams as the staple. Pieces from these termite mounds will hold the heat of the fire. <laughs> For tens of thousands of years, Australian Aboriginals lived without the use of a cooking pot, relying instead on many sophisticated ways of using fire. Here the yams are protected from the flames by using paper bark and vegetation soaked in water. Covering the whole thing in earth turns the fire into a huge oven, where the yams will effectively be steamed for about an hour. Milk 
There is a very direct relationship with animals as food here, which is shared by even the youngest of those present. Their natural curiosity is a thing of survival itself. The guana needs cleaning, and then Clara ties it up with pandanus fibers to stop the legs burning and being wasted. It's simple, but effective. There are two types of yam here, the long yam, which can be eaten straight away, and the cheeky yam, which will need to process once they're cooled. Wow, they look good, don't they? I can smell them. They smell wonderful. Wow. Mm, that's really good. Oh, Very good. Aboriginal techniques are proudly passed from one generation to the next by the elders. Clara demonstrates how to butcher a cooked guana using just a stick. This is how we use in olden days. They have no knife set. They always use stick. The stick will leave no marks on the skeleton to betray any signs of butchery and will eventually rot away. A reminder just how difficult exploring the past is. <laughs> it's ready to eat. My chance to turn the camera on the crew. You <coughs> taste it? Yeah, definitely fish. Yeah. Definitely fish. Good. I'll say more, more chicken. Mm. Fishy chicken. Well, I'll ask you the question. It must be good. Cheeky yams are actually poisonous and need processing to make them edible. Have the young girls seen this? <coughs> Have you seen this before? A snail shell becomes a useful grater. Plants like the yam are the way hunter gatherers ensure they get enough calories. In Britain today, our staples are bread, pasta, potatoes, and rice, none of which existed in our hunter-gatherer past. What we're learning here will open our minds to the possibilities of staples hidden in our own flora. Very sticky, isn't it? Making a bit of a mess of this. Keep going. Keep going. We'll have to wait until tomorrow, our last day, to eat them. They need a good soak to leach out the toxins. How did you find grating the cheeky ant? Well, a bit sticky. <laughs> it was, it was, that, that, that snail method worked. Okay. I was going to ask you, you know, if an archaeologist was to uncover something like that in a British dig, do you think they would attribute it with any importance? No, not what I think there's not, not a snowball, snowball chance in Hades of that happening. Uh, I think it would, just, it would be a god as a snail that's got damaged. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but it's a very, very effective tool, isn't it? It's a very effective tool. It's so simple. So simple. Uh, I mean, to me, there's an elegant beauty in that that really sums up the knowledge of these people. Mm. Everyone here has such detailed knowledge, but earlier I was particularly impressed by Marley. It's typical in a society that has relied on such skills for so long. 
interesting. going through uh, the book with that young woman. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was a book written by um, people further south of here who've recorded their, 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 their bush law, and she was looking with the greatest detail at the, at the picture, she knew exactly which features on which plants she needed to look for. Now, I guess that's not surprising to a botanist, but these aren't botanists, these are just ordinary, ordinary mm -hmm. folk, and the, what I think we see here is this, this continuing tradition um, of the use of bush foods and bush resources for medicine and so on that requires people to have an, uh, a very acute memory and a very good attention to detail mm. um, in a way that the modern world doesn't encourage people today. Indeed. For me, one of the best illustrations of this knowledge and attention to detail is the way Clara and the others are able to find yams. Anyone can dig them up, but I've tried finding them before and always failed. And this time, I'm determined to succeed. Clara. I've come hunting for yams in yes. the past, long time ago. Long time ago. I had real trouble. Ah, I see. Because it's difficult to see them, isn't it? It is. Yeah, and I'm watching you. What are you looking for? Yam. Yeah, but what? What do you... I watch. You don't just go, yam. You have to look carefully. That's no good? No. No, that for seed. For the seeds. Yeah. So you're, but you're looking what for the for the, the, the vine first, yes. and then to identify it, yes. you look up, and then you look for the seeds in the tree. Yes. Can you show me? Yes. This posture when people are looking, it's a stance so familiar. All hunter gatherers do the same. Oh, you found one. Okay. So, so this is one. Yeah. How do you know? Ah, these seed pods right at the yeah. top. You can tell it. Yeah, I see that. Puyumara. 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 Yes. Puyumara. 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 Yeah. Okay, Puyumara. That's long yam. Yeah. In your language. In your language. Okay. Yeah. We ate long yams roasted yesterday, but they can be eaten raw. You can try a bit of that. Sure. That's good. That's nice. It's nice, isn't it? It's good eating. Good pepper. Now we're looking for cheeky yams. The best time to gather these is autumn, when all the goodness has gone into the roots, leaving the leaves withered and dry. But the only way to tell the cheeky yam from the long yam is by tiny differences in their leaves. It's amazing. You wouldn't believe it. I've spent weeks trying to spot the difference between these. Once they're withered and dry, it's so difficult, really difficult to spot the difference. Women like Robin rely on being able to spot these minute differences. Yeah. Well, I reckon that is cheeky yam, but I'm usually wrong. Let's see, Robin. Is that cheeky yam? Yeah. I've got one right. I've got one right. I can't believe it. <laughs> At last, a breakthrough, and Gordon has a true botanist's way of summing it up. Till earlier, my confidence was a little bit not. It's okay. coming back now. Your accumulated apex is rather shallower. <laughs> Shorter leaf. <laughs> Once a botanist, always a botanist. But what Gordon means is the cheeky yam is slightly less pointy than the long yam, but you'll just have to take my word for it. It's impossible to show on camera. Is that it here, going down? It's broken, isn't it? Mm. That's the difficulty. When they break, then it's hard to find where they go into the ground. Watch how carefully Robin searches for what she's looking for. It's a real art. This is just a pile of twigs. But this is what hunting and gathering is all about. Patience, 
attention to detail, and knowing when to give up. You can't find it. Yeah. And would you now go somewhere else to look for another one? Yeah. Yeah, hey, that's all right. Well, there you go. If you can't find the part sticking out of the ground, you have to move on. There's no point in wasting energy searching aimlessly underground. That's really interesting because we have a route back in Britain we're interested in, which we think may be similar in many ways to the cheeky yam. And uh, these gathering problems are exactly the same sort of thing that our ancestors may once have faced. But our ancestors must have been just as persistent and just as successful as Robin is. Otherwise, none of us would be here today. As our journey across Australia draws to a close, it's been a wonderful reminder of what it is about hunting and gathering that makes it so special. A taste of the role of food in this society and a great introduction for Gordon to this way of life. The bad taste is gone. Yes. I think the thing that's impressed me most is the way in which their culture here, all sorts of cultural components, their stories, their a whole, whole range of, of spiritual traditions, affect their subsistence activities. There are a whole, whole uh, a battery of, of influences that, above all, I think help maintain that knowledge, maintain those traditions, the maintenance of these storylines, so important that they pass on to their children, uh, is, is a way of ensuring that this knowledge continues. And I think this, the role of these cultural factors has really impressed me hugely. Obviously, they would have been very different in Britain 6,000 years ago, entirely different. But on the other hand, just the, the overall fact that culture can play this sort of role uh, uh, in, in, in this present-day hunter-gatherer society does raise these possibilities for our British past. Thanks to their care for their heritage, the Aboriginals of Australia have brought hunting and gathering alive for us in a way we could never do at home. We can now go back to Britain with our minds full of the possibilities of what existed in our long vanished past. I'm not suggesting for one moment that what we've seen here is how things were in Britain, but certainly we've seen from the songs and the dances, and we've only just scratched the surface, that Aboriginal lives are intricately tied to their food resources and to the land itself. I can't wait to get back to Britain to explore our foods and what they might have meant to our hunter-gatherer forebears. Ray Mears returns next Wednesday at 8. More details in just a moment. And stay with us here on BBC Two Next for an insight into our £1 trillion economy in what makes Britain rich.